question. The is over here. Great. And uh, very quickly, I would like to present uh, something that we're hoping will turn into a new tradition in the nano meetings. And this is expanding our horizons a little bit beyond our usual science. And today we have with us uh, Professor Rak. He's a member of the Israel Academy of Science and uh, a very popular uh, anatomy lecturer in the School of Medicine. So Professor Rak started his uh, career in the Hebrew University learning uh, plantology, uh, fossil science, and then did his master's in Tel Aviv University in anatomy and went off to Berkeley for a PhD in uh, evolution of man, right? And human evolution and women. They did evolve and much faster than we did. Um, and then now he shares his time between teaching in Tel Aviv, uh, expeditions in Africa, including the famous uh, Lucy, right? Maybe we'll hear something about it. And uh, also um, uh, caves here in Israel where he studies the Neanderthal uh, history. And let's hear all about it. Thank you, Professor Wack. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, uh, I always start my lectures with an episode. When, when I was a young student many years ago in Berkeley, I was asked as, a, as an Israeli student, I was asked to give a lecture to the general public um, of something significant that was found here in Israel. And uh, not far away from here, there is a cave that is called the Galilee Cave, and uh, a, a spectacular find in, 1920, in 1925, it was discovered, and it was dubbed as the Galilee Man, a very famous skull. And uh, so I chose to talk about the significance of the Galilee Man, and uh, and to my horror, I realized suddenly among, among the audience, I saw a lot of priests and a lot of nuns. And I realized suddenly that they came to hear, about, listen about a different Galilee man. And uh, so here we are in Nazareth. And I'm, 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 from the outset of my talk, I'm going to emphasize the fact that I'm going to speak about uh, fossils and about Neanderthals. And Neanderthals are really a fascinating topic, both from a, from a historical point of view and from an anatomical point of view as well. Historical point of view, is, uh, people tend to forget, but uh, Neanderthals were actually uh, discovered two years before the origin of species. And, uh, and, uh, the first Neanderthal that was, today we know it wasn't the first, but the first one that was presented to the father of modern pathology, uh, uh, Rudolf Virchow, uh, he arrogantly examined the skull and he decided, this is two years before the origin of species, he decided that it's either a, an imbecile, pathological imbecile, or a Russian soldier. <laughs> so this was, I mean, this, this gives you just a sense of the historical background of Neanderthal, of Neanderthal uh, discoveries. Ne the, the study of Neanderthal is, was actually inflicted by, by two trends. And it is kind of a pendulum that is switching from one side to another. The first trend was since people were very eager to document human evolution the moment the, the, the theory was proposed, people were so eager to, to document uh, uh, evolution in the human history that every fossil that was discovered was forced, really forced into a line leading to modern humans. Whether it was, it was justified to do it or not, the first fossils were kind of pushed into, into human sequence. 
And you can see here the very famous Neanderthal skull that was uh, discovered in 1911. It was put here just before in a very naive and a very innocent way. It was put here as bridging the gap between a chimp and a human. I was uh, not uh, long ago, I, I actually purchased this book that was published right after the very dramatic uh, discoveries in, uh, in Mount Carmel. And you can see here that, that you can uh, realize the same sense of a uh, chain, the ladder of progress in Palestine. In other words, there, there is, with the discovery of the Neanderthals on Mount Carmel, there is already a link or a chain, a ladder that leads to modern humans. It's, uh, it's a, as I said, it's a very naive and, and uh, innocent way of viewing evolution in general, and especially human evolution. I, and and this is, this is uh, something that uh, you can find in the popular media everywhere, and I, my, one, of my, my, one of my hobbies is to collect these images that describe, describe evolution, including human evolution, as, as a chain leading in a very smooth way, leading to modern humans. And you can see it here, I have a lot of these slides. It, I have another one that, uh, that actually came from California, and instead of walking, they are all jogging, of course. Okay, so, uh, and you can see it here, the Neanderthal always was depicted as something, you know, not, not too smart, right behind our uh, modern humans. So this was one trend that was very popular, especially at the beginning, when, when uh, Darwin theo theory was just introduced and right after. The other trend um, or the other switch where the pendulum went to the other side was uh, viewing the Neanderthal, and this is during the 60s, you know, during the, the uh, flower people and we, all, we were all one at that time. And the trend actually portrayed the Neanderthal not as a link in a chain, but as just very similar to us. The, the, the famous motif, it's called the, the uh, Neanderthal in the New York subway, described something like this, you know, a Neanderthal dressed with a, dressed with a hat and, and uh, looks very normal. And, and you will understand in a second why the New York subway, it's called the motif of the New York subway. So the claim is that if a Neanderthal dressed like this is walking to the subway in New York, and uh, no wonder it is New York, nobody will pay attention to it. Okay, it looks very much like us. And, uh, and this, was, uh, this was very popular, a very popular approach in the 60s. As I said, part of the politi political uh, agenda of that time reflected, was reflected in this view. I uh, have this poster hanging out of my office in the medical school. And one day I saw one of my medical students walking by and I said, wait a minute here because I have to run and get my camera. Because what we see here <laughs> is a Neanderthal, okay, a Neanderthal walking in my corridor. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that Neanderthals are very different from us. Anatomically, they are extremely interesting. And uh, I'll start by describing, and this is usually how the Neanderthal is described, much of its unique appearance actually lies here in the face. And the Neanderthal is described as if somebody was pulling the nose and stretching all the bony, bony plate behind it. In other words, we don't see any angulation when, uh, when traveling from the ear opening to the nasal opening, we see a smooth plate of bone. And this is in sharp contrast to what we see in modern humans, and everybody can palpate, 
palpated here, this corner, is actually dividing the, the, the osteological face, okay, the bony face, into a front-facing part, a lateral-facing part, and the corner is actually is the, is the border between these two plates. Now, it, it is very easy to realize um, what I'm talking about when we are examining a Neanderthal skull from the base, okay? You can see here that there is really no angulation from the ear to the nose, and this is in sharp contrast to what you see in modern humans. This is the corner I was talking about. Okay, so, and I'll go back for a second. I'll draw your attention to another very unique uh, character of Neanderthal. This is the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is, the, is the, actually the big uh, foramen that permits the, uh, the spinal cord to get into the skull or to get out of the skull. And the, and the peculiar thing about the foramen magnum in Neanderthal is that it's oval, unlike us, and unlike many other creatures, uh, we have a round foramen magnum. And we'll come back to it later. And the big question throughout the history of Neanderthal research was what does, what does it mean? We call this procedure, we call it reverse engineering. As if you are going to the flea market and you get something, a machine that looks very peculiar, you bring, you bring it home, and then you are trying to go into the mind of the engineer. What is this instrument for? This is called reverse engineering. And the same thing, we are employing the same uh, method with fossils even though the, the, the engineer, of course, is natural selection. So there were all kinds of ideas uh, that were proposed in the past. One viewed the, the very peculiar face of Neanderthal uh, as an adaptation to severe cold conditions in Europe. And the nose, the, this big nose, was actually depicted as an, an enormous radiator that heats the, the air that goes into the lung. In essence, what we see here, we see that these bony plates here are switching from this orientation to that orientation. Okay? And in essence, this is what, this is the Neanderthal. This is the essence of the Neanderthal face. This one we call it the generalized face, the primitive face, and I hope I, I won't insult anyone, but we have the generalized, the very common uh, pattern uh, of, uh, of uh, face among the primates. So many, many primates, they have this arrangement, including the chimp, including all Lucy, and including many other fossils. This is very peculiar, very peculiar. I myself, I think that it has to do with the load, the, the very unusual load that the Neanderthals were exerting on the anterior teeth. We don't know why, but apparently they were loading the anterior teeth in a very severe way. Now, this to load the anterior teeth, everyone from our own experience, I'm sure everyone experienced it, if you are trying to crack a very stubborn pistachio with the anterior teeth, you feel very uncomfortable and automatically you move the pistachio to the posterior teeth because in terms of the architecture of the face, this is the place to exert pressure. For some strange reason, if I'm right, the Neanderthal was using the anterior teeth. This is very interesting. And by switching the bony plate to, the, to what we call the sagittal plane, it assists him to cope with the, with the load, the occlusal load on the anterior teeth. Now the point here is, and this is Darth Vader, it looks like Darth Vader, 
But this is, in essence, the very simple and very schematic biomechanics of the Neanderthal face. In other thing, in other way, um, in other words, I'm saying, if, if the anterior part of the face is loaded, it makes a lot of sense to change the bony plate to support the, the palate in its front. Now, we do have evidence that they did use the anterior teeth. This is, and this is very common among Neanderthals. You can see in Neanderthal that the anterior teeth are worn down to the roots. There is really no enamel in the anterior teeth. And you can see it here very clearly, okay, that the anterior teeth are actually exposing the pulp chamber, okay, the pulp cavity chamber. And, uh, and uh, if somebody is interested, or usually it's very intriguing, uh, was it painful? No, it wasn't. And I cannot, I cannot go into it, but it wasn't painful here. So it, it actually doesn't matter what is, the, what is the functional interpretation for the unique Neanderthal face. What really is important is the fact that before the Neanderthals, we had very generalized faces, very much like us, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, even chimpanzees. They have, in essence, the same, uh, the same face. And it would be very uneconomical to start a voyage from a very generalized face to switch to a very peculiar face, no matter what is the explanation, and then to switch back to our generalized face. This is very uneconomical, hence not parsimonious solution. It would be much, much better to extend the primitive phase up to us in the present and to put the Neanderthal on a side branch. In other words, the Neanderthal is not marching along a ladder or along a parade to, to evolve to modern humans, it actually evolved in parallel to us and went its way and eventually went extinct. I'll, I'll, take, you, I'll take you for a trip in some of the caves. One of, one of the caves, it's not this one, but one of the caves is a very famous cave about uh, less than a mile away from here. Just, it's called the Kafze cave, and we'll come back to it. It's underneath the Jabal Kafze that you can see here, uh, really uh, 500 meters away. But what I want to show you is a, a, a cave uh, that was excavated. This is not, the Wadi Amud, not far, again, not far away from here. This is the Amud, or the pillar. In Arabic, it's called Ras El Amud, and we call it the the pillar. In the 60s, the Japanese came and excavated this cave. And uh, I know that my colleagues abroad find it very entertaining to realize that even though we climb on sheer cliffs here for 100 meters, and e eventually we reach the cave, and we are still 100 meters below sea level. Okay? This is very strange to people who, don't, who, don't, uh, uh, who are not acquainted with the Jordan Valley. But anyway, this cave was excavated uh, in the 60s by Professor Suzuki uh, with his team. He came from, uh, from uh, Japan. He was lucky enough to find a Neanderthal skeleton there. And in the 90s, I took it upon myself to renew the excavation and to, to sort some problems out and hoping for more hominid discoveries. And indeed, this is the old trench of the Japanese. We extended it to the south and we extended the trench to the north. The skeleton that they found was, is, is here. This is, by the way, my son that came to help me for two days. And after two days, he realized paleontology is not for him. Okay. So uh, we were lucky. We were lucky here 
at this at this corner here, at the second at our second season, we hit a Neanderthal baby, nine months old. Okay, don't expect to see something lying in a crib. It looks like a shakshuka. Okay, <laughs> here it is. But you can see the mandible. You can see the collapsed skull, the vertebral colon, the pelvis, hand and foot. So we were very excited. This is nine-month-old baby. I'll, a closer look. Here is the here is the jaw, and you can see the teeth. Just the, the deciduous teeth are just erupting. Now why is it so exciting? Why is it so exciting to realize at the age, at the tender age of nine months, to realize that we are talking about Neanderthals? Well, in biology we are very well uh, aware of this phenomena. The younger the individual is, the more difficult it is to assign it taxonomically. In other words, it, even professionals, if they are given a gorilla and a human skull at the age of, let's say, two months, they won't be able to distinguish them. And as, as, as the individuals matures, then you can see the difference. Now, this is very interesting because this is a nine-month-old baby, and we are able to say with no difficulties that it's a Neanderthal. You can tell it's a Neanderthal because you can see the foramen magnum and it's oval, okay? Very oval, very unusual. And why is it so exciting? Because what it actually tells us how taxonomically the Neanderthal is different and how extreme is the deviation or phylogenetic deviation from our branch, okay? This is the reason why we we are able to detect the fact that it's a Neanderthal in such a young individual. Here it is. This is the foramen magnum. And there are others. This is a specimen from U Europe and Gs. The same thing. Now we come to Jabal Kafse. This is the Jabal that is about 500 meters away from here. It's called Jabal Kafse, which means the, the, the cliff of the jump. Because when Jesus was running away from Nazareth, ch chased by the Romans, he came to this point, marvelous point to visit. <laughs> oh, you were there? Yes. Okay, but the cave is underneath. You can see this is the cave and this is the, uh, the peak. So uh, when Jesus was running away from this point, he gave a jump to Mount Tabor. Okay? Now, this is in oral, oral tradition. It's not in the Bible. So don't look for it in the Bible. And you can see the fantastic Jezreel Valley from the cave itself. Now, the cave itself was excavated in the 30s, okay? And fossils, solid bone, I'm sorry, solid stone came out from this cave about 25 of them. Everybody realized that they look like humans, including the chin, and including the forehead that is very steep. Everybody recognized and acknowledged that we are talking about modern humans. But the big thing was that it was before dating methods, because they looked so much modern, so much like us, they were dated it's 25,000. Why? Because Neanderthals are 100,000, and Neanderthals presumably are the ancestor of modern humans, and these are on the way to become Neanderthals. So it was, they were uh, determined, okay, this is the only case in history that I know that the cave, the, the, the date of the cave is determined by, by the fossils that uh, were discovered. This is very interesting because a good friend of mine, the late Professor Chernov in, uh, in uh, uh, Jerusalem, he was studying, he is a paleontologist, was unfortunately was a paleontologist, he was studying the microfauna from the same cave. And he, in every conference, stood up and he says, it's impossible that 
the skull is 25,000 years. Because the microfauna indicate that we are talking about 100,000 years. And I remember how in every con conference people were laughing at him. Okay? How can it be that something that looks so much like us is actually older than most of the fossils, than most of the Neanderthal fossils in this region? Okay? Because people were so captured. Okay? They were prisoners of their preconceived ideas. And lo and behold, in the 90s, where methods, the physics department provided us with, with dating methods, it turned out that the, the fossils are 100,000 years old. And you can see these are modern looking, and you can see the foramen is round, and this is another specimen. They look very much like us, but still very old in time, in geological time. Already the first hint that we are talking about two parallel branches that are evolving, one that reached present day and the other one went extinct about uh, 25 or 30,000 years ago. I'll take you to another cave and I, I, I'll just mention some very basic anatomy, embarrassingly simple, okay? This is the human mandible. And the human mandible, everyone has the same thing. I don't know about the teeth of the mandible. It's everyone has the same anatomy. And you can see that it has a, a horizontal element and a, and a vertical element. This is called the ascending ramus. It terminates with two processes. And there is a big notch separating these two processes. And the deepest point of the notch is right in the middle, midway between these two processes. Very simple. But when we go to a Neanderthal, we see a different thing. We see this is tall, the, the, frontal, the front process is tall, the back process is very low, and the notch between them is not symmetrical, and it's very shallow, okay? Very sh shallow, close to the posterior process. And this, this can be found in every Neanderthal fossil. Interestingly enough, and it, again, this is a cave that I recommend to visit. This is the, uh, the Tabun cave, or Mearata, Mearata Tanur in Mount, Cam Mount Carmel. This is, a, this is a, a, a national park, and as a matter of fact, it's now a UNESCO, a, what is it, a human her heritage uh, site. And this, uh, this uh, cave was excavated in the late 20s of the last century, and I'm here standing as a yardstick to, to impress you how intensive is the archaeological record. And it is a very important case. Now, the, the interesting point here is that at this point here, a skeleton of a Neanderthal woman was discovered. And about six meters to the north, another mandible was discovered at the same layer. Now, this is the female, and you can, you, very badly damaged, but you can see very clearly we are talking about a Neanderthal mandible. Lo and behold, the other one that was, that was actually in the same layer looks like a homo sapiens. And this drove the researchers crazy. I asked my graduate students, I asked them to go and to read the volume, it's, it's this side. I asked them just to read the relevant page. And it's really almost entertaining to read and to see how twisted the explanation is and how concocted is the whole, the whole description they, because they didn't know how to cope with the fact that the son, and the, the, the son and the father are actually at the same layer. And they tried all kind of tricks and this is really worth, worthwhile uh, reading. 
Now this, uh, this contour here can be quantified, okay, by plotting very simple, by plotting it on a coordinate. You can use Fourier analysis and other things. But I just plotted it here, and I see this is the posterior uh, process, the posterior uh, end, and this is the anterior end. And you can see that this is the Neanderthal outline. Since it is plotted, we can quantify the cross-section with the coordinate and give them 20 variables that describe the curvature. Now, I went and measured 400 homo sapiens from Eskimos to Kalahari Desert. This is the distribution, and because it is quantified now, you can actually calculate the mean and standard deviation and you see that the Neanderthal is quite different. In the past, when I was a young student, it was enough just to present it this way. But today, of course, we have to quantify and to run statistics. And since everything is described in 20 numerical uh, values, we can run the multivariate analysis. And you can see this is the Neanderthal and this is Homo sapiens. And sure enough, the lady that I just showed fall right with the Neanderthal, and the other mandible falls right with Homo sapiens. Okay? Here we see, within the same layer, we see uh, two species of humanity. Now, please remember that I'm not saying that these two individuals were sitting in the cave and playing cards, okay? Because the resolution of the plus minus that the, the dates are giving us is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, wide. And uh, it's not inconceivable that the Neanderthal was sitting in the, in the cave. And about four or five or maybe a thousand years later, Homo sapiens came and vice versa. Okay, we don't know. Now, <clears throat> I gave this talk in, uh, in Zagreb, uh, and some, some old guy came to me and told me, I was, sure, I was sure that I'm genius to note all these things. And he actually uh, pointed out, drew my attention to the fact that in 1914, uh, a Croatian paleontologist, Gorjanovic uh, Kremberger, already noticed these differences in an obscure Croatian journal, and he even made an attempt to quantify them. So I have to give him the credit. But the interesting thing here is that I was talking about how tall is the anterior process. When we align Homo sapiens on the occlusal plane, on the level of the teeth, we can see the, uh, that the anterior, the, cor the coronoid, are the same in size. But what is actually, what, what is the difference actually lies in the fact that the condyle, okay, the condyle is very low. This is fantastic because the moment the condyle is low, it means that the mouth can be opened much wider. And this connect us with the anterior dentition because, and the very peculiar wear of the, the uh, anterior uh, dentition, because in the anterior part, the distance between the upper and lower teeth is the greatest. Still, it is a mystery why Neanderthals needed to open their mouth so wide. We cannot figure it out. And we went everywhere to try and figure it out. Maybe a frozen Neanderthal one day will give us the answer. Oh, we, he, he, should be, he should be alive, right? frozen and alive. And of course, this is what I, I showed you before. Another cave is also one of the Mount Carmel caves. It's a little bit south to the classical caves of Mount Carmel. It's called the Kabara Cave, just opposite to Magan Michael. And we excavated in the 80s. From outside, it looks like a hole in the ground. Okay, here it is. 
And, but for inside, it, oh, I'm sorry. Inside, it's really a beautiful karst cave. And the Department of Anatomy and uh, uh, archaeologists from the Hebrew University um, and the French team that came from Bordeaux, we, ex we re-excavated this cave. And right underneath here, right underneath here, lying uh, eight meters below, this, below the surface, we were fortunate enough to actually hit a Neanderthal burial. You can see that this individual that you'll see in a second is actually lying in a grave that was excavated into uh, earlier layers and was sealed with, more, with later, with later uh, layers. This is a Neanderthal lying supine on his back. Unfortunately, the skull is gone. We don't know what happened. And uh, we were mourning the fact that the skull is gone so bitterly that we failed to notice that this guy has a treasure under the belt, as we say, uh, in the shape, in the shape of uh, the only Neanderthal pelvis that we know, okay? And this, I cannot go into the details, but the pelvis is as different from modern humans as the face, as the face are, or is. In, this is a very sore, sore point with the Hebrew. In English, you say face are, and in, and in face, in, uh, no, the, in English, face is, and in Hebrew, face are. Rabim, actually. Okay, and it's very confusing. Here it is. Okay, beautiful specimen. And uh, why do I show it? Because this cave, okay, this cave, about uh, 20, 20 kilometers south of, uh, south of Haifa, and the Neanderthal that was discovered in it, is actually the most southern extension of the Neanderthal territory. Neanderthals, they are actually a European species, and the margins and the periphery of their distribution is going to the Middle East. Okay, so these are, these are the Neanderthals. Very tough life. We know it from what we call the index of pathology arthritic joints, abscesses, terrible uh, uh, bone breakage, a lot of pathology in, in uh, Neanderthal skeletons. And just to tell us that life wasn't a picnic then, especially not in Europe, okay? Europe was really a very unpleasant place to live at that time. These are Neanderthals. And this is the Neanderthal in, the, in Krapina. You can see the whole, uh, the whole world of fauna was really very cold fauna, including rhinos that were hairy. Okay, they were with a very heavy coat. So where are we now? I still have time. Yeah. What? Ten more minutes, my gosh, I, well, well, I'll finish before. Okay, so um, Neanderthals and their habitat and their ecological niche in Europe extending to the Middle East, where the Middle East, Israel is, in a way, is actually the border of their territory. It is also the border of Homo sapiens that is coming out of Africa. Because Neanderthals were very pleased with the very cold condition because they were already adapted biologically to cold conditions. We see it in many, many uh, characters of their skeleton, including proportions of the limb to the trunk. This is a very typical cold adaptation. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, came from Africa, tall, slender, and 
beautiful in our eyes, I guess. Although I love, I love Neanderthals. <laughs> and they came from Africa and apparently reached, at, the, at that point, 100,000 years ago, reached the Middle East and didn't advance, okay, because it was too cold and very unpleasant. So here we are. We have the Neanderthals territory. Now we know the Neanderthal is expanding farther to the east. But here in Israel is actually the border of their distribution. And Homo sapiens in Africa, this is the border of distribution for him. And because the glaciers and the very harsh conditions that come with the glaciers are actually shifting, okay, we see in the caves of Israel, we see that they, the caves are actually sampling sometimes the Neanderthal. When the, when the glaciers are retreating, Homo sapiens is being sampled in the cave. And it goes back and forth, back and forth several times. So the big mess that puzzled so many generations of researchers about what's going on here in the, in the Middle East, especially in Israel, stems, in my, opinion, in my opinion, just from the fact that this was the borderline and the borderline was shifting. I'm talking about, let's say, 25,000 years, shifting quite a lot from Africa to Europe, to Europe and from Europe back to Africa. So this is about what I have to say. This was very refreshing. And uh, we'll take some questions. <laughs> OK, so if I understood you correctly, you, you mentioned that they did actually bury the, um, the corpse. Speak louder. Because louder. So you mentioned that they did actually bury. Uh, yeah. They did a burial. They digged up. Why do it in the cave where they actually? Oh, they were, yeah. This is, this is very interesting. I mean, there are a lot of stories about Neanderthals and a lot of movies. This is, this is the caveman that was depicted in the encyclopedia, you know, where, when we got for the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. Okay? This was a, a very stereotypic, very stereotypic. Uh, not much can be actually found and documented. But the burial, there is really no doubt that they buried their dead in the place they were living in, okay? This is not uncommon among human population even today. Um, the interesting thing, and there is really, you, when you excavate a cave that contains Neanderthals, you, you get the sense that they were, even though it, described, it is described as, as a given fact, but you get the sense that they were a community in the cave. There are a lot of hearts, fire hearts, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cave. And there are several specimens uh, that are, there is one that is amputated. Uh, I don't have the slide. Uh, he's amputated and he was, he was actually healed, okay? Now, First of all, today, if somebody loses an arm, it's because of a war, because of explosions, because of a car accident, or things like this. When a Neanderthal loses an arm, and the whole arm became actually paralyzed, you have to, you have to uh, Im Im imagine a very dramatic scenario. Maybe a confrontation with a bear. Ursus Paleus was, was the, the traditional uh, enemy of the Neanderthals. They were fighting for space in the caves, okay? So, but the point that I'm trying to say is that somebody actually took care of him, of this individual, because he was running a high fever for many, many days, and it's a clue for the social organization of Neanderthals. On the other hand, Neanderthals are quite different from us, not only anatomically, 
but, but uh, culturally as well. There is no trace of aesthetic art. Homo sapiens have a lot of art associated with, in his cave. But with Neanderthal, even not a perforated beat, nothing. And this is very, very intriguing and very interesting. Uh, apparently, they were not interested. In, they, they had a different head. Okay. By the way, the brain capacity was larger than ours. And it has to do with the cold condition. Okay. Although they are different, uh, well, they are similar as well. Uh, is there some common uh, source for model uh, for Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals? If and they had a common ancestor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, there is no doubt that they had a common ancestor. We know because we, we have the genome of Neanderthal today, and we have obviously the genome of Homo sapiens. We know that the split was about 600,000 years ago. Okay, but we all animal kingdom, I don't know, I, I hope I'm not surprising you, but we and the avocado, we have a common ancestor. But it was a long, long time ago. And how did they become extinct? I'm sorry? Why did, the they, microphone. Why did they disappear? Oh, whoa, this is, a, this is a very good question. Why did they disappear? Uh, they were specialized in many ways. Okay, as, as I try to demonstrate, uh, this is very obvious whether we know the exact functional explanation or not. They were specialized anatomically. And with specialization in animal kingdom, on one hand, it's really fantastic because uh, you are exploiting the niche that actually g gave rise to you in a very efficient way. But being specialized, on the other hand, makes you a slave of, a, of very certain and specific conditions. And we, we know it from many, many other species. They become more and more and more specialized until they are so dependent and so, uh, um, uh, well, dependent on a, on, a, on a certain ecological niche that a small switch brings the extinction, extinction. Now, Homo sapiens is also specialized. Of course, I'm not talking about walking bipedally, because they both walked uh, bipedal. But I'm talking about the brain. This is a very, a very impressive specialization in the animal kingdom. And it's unique in its kind. Because the, the more specialized is the brain, the less dependent you are on a certain ecological niche. You can actually spread all over, as we did. And if you think about it, even landing on the moon is an outcome of this specialization. Okay. Um, horses and donkeys. I'm uh, sorry? Horses and donkeys can breed into a mule. Oh, yeah. And Are you talking about breeding? Is there evidence for yeah. interbreeding? Well, now, now that we have the genome, uh, uh, first of all, we have to define. It's not an easy task. Um, uh, and I, uh, four years, in, uh, five years in Berkeley, there was not a single week that went uh, by without a discussion about the definition of a species. What is a species? And it's not settled. The most common, the most common uh, criteria is if they exchange genes uh, willingly, okay, and they produce uh, fertile offsprings. So horse and, don and a donkey, they produce a mule that is actually sterile. We are talking about two species. Now, since we do have the genome, there is Recently, though it, it's not in the mycot uh, mycot my mitochondrial DNA, my mitochondrial DNA, but in the real uh, nuclear DNA, we see that there is a trace 
very, very little of Neanderthal DNA that went from a male to a female Homo sapiens and not the other way around. Very dramatic, okay? And so some people say maybe they, they had uh, gene exchange. They didn't have gene exchange. They had one direction uh, gene flow from Neanderthal men to the Neanderthal women. I'm sorry, to Homo sapiens women. Real and men. this is why in the, in the mitochondrial DNA, you don't find, a, in, in Neanderthal, you don't find a, traces of Homo sapiens a, a DNA. A, the, the difference between them anatomically is so great that if you take the yardstick, okay, of what is known today to define a species in a living uh, world, there is no doubt that we are talking about two different species, okay, because of the magnitude of the, of the anatomical differences. And still I have to say that they are very close species, okay, very close species. And you have to remember that among 10% 10, among 10 of legit, legitimate species living today, there is some kind of a, a gene exchange. So this is what I have to say about. Now I was saying, I'll just add one more thing, because I was saying that the common ancestor lived six, 600,000 years ago. We know from the DNA Homo sapiens, that the origin of Homo sapiens is about 150, maybe 200,000 years ago. Okay, this is the origin of the species Homo sapiens. In other words, in order to bring the two branches together, we are missing some players. And maybe the, the very small quantity of Neanderthal DNA is going through this chain. Okay? And Neanderthal and Homo sapiens didn't interbreed. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Let's welcome. thank Professor Rack again.